So hi everyone, uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Uh, Wayne Fuchs has worked with PXD International since its founding. He's one of the retinologists who, uh, in the world who has seen most PXD patients. Um, he is very good at explaining difficult concepts that, uh, in a way that the rest of us can understand. Um, and we're so excited to have him here for this webinar on PXC in the eye. Um, like I said at the beginning, if anyone has any questions, uh, please hold them till the end or use the chat feature. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Well, thank you for that introduction. I don't see the chat feature, so I guess uh, you'll interrupt me if there is a burning question. If something's unclear, I think I should be stopped at that point and asked about it. Otherwise, okay. at the end, okay. So thank you again for that introduction and thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, I will be talking about PXC and the eye. Um, there was a talk two weeks ago on the magnesium trial by Dr. Lebwal, who was the uh, principal investigator in that trial. So I can answer questions about that, but I will summarize the results as we get started, which is that the uh, magnesium trial did not show a statistically significant improvement in patients, but did show a trend toward decreased calcification. And so uh, the paper has not been published yet for some reason. It's been rewritten and revised, and, uh, but the uh, results will show that. And uh, Dr. Lebo was asked about whether he recommends magnesium, and he, he does recommend re magnesium supplements. As far as the eye manifestations, which we will be talking about, it did not show any uh, significant change in the eye condition. And some of the reasons may include the uh, exclusion criteria. The people that entered the uh, magnesium trial, there was no exclusion criteria, meaning if they were being treated by their private ophthalmologist with uh, current treatments, whether they're anti-VEGF injections or other modalities, they were not excluded from the trial and the treatments continued. So when we would examine them at the 12, the, the enrollment day, 12 months and 24 months, many times the vision, the amount of fluid or the amount of thickening, the things we were measuring would vary depending upon when they had last seen their ophthalmologist, when they had last received treatment. And so um, it really washed out and the placebo and control groups were um, equal. Um, so there was no benefit, but we did feel that if uh, treatment was started at an earlier stage before people had uh, already had disease or end stage disease or early leakage and bleeding that perhaps it might have shown a benefit. And so we will uh, support Dr. Lebel's uh, recommendation for continuing magnesium supplements, but there was no statistically significant improvement in the eye condition in that small trial. So let me go on and talk about um, pseudoxanthoma and how it does affect the eye. Um, I am not, a, maybe I'll advance the slide that way. Excellent. So just a quick review. This is a cross-sectional view of, of an eye and the front of the eye is called the cornea. The light passes through the cornea, through the pupil, and hopefully some of you can see my small arrow, through the lens of the eye, which is where people sometimes get a cataract. And then the light and image passes through the vitreous cavity to the back of the eye where it falls on the retinal surface, which is sometimes uh, thought of as the film in the camera. It, the center of the retina, it's labeled here fovea, but we call it the macula. The very center of the macula is the fovea. And the information uh, which lands on the macula uh, and the retina is brought to the brain through the optic nerve. So uh, the, every part of the eye is important, but the, uh, we will be talking about how pseudoxanthoma affects the eye, and that is in the back part of the eye, in the retina, and specifically in this small region called the macula. And the next slide shows, again, the cross-section on top with the uh, arrow pointing to the center of the retina or the macula. And here's a frontal view where you see the nerve. This is just the tip of the optic nerve that we see when we look in. 
That nerve travels back to the brain. <clears throat> you see retinal blood vessels, which are normal. We'll be talking about abnormal vessels later. And the macula, which is the center part of the retina, which is responsible for the detailed vision. We call it the central vision, the fine vision, the vision that you use when you are reading. You would line up your macula on a word if you're trying to read that word. If you're trying to recognize a face, it is the macula which would be looking at the person. And basically, if the optic nerve is made up of approximately one million fibers, about half of those fibers come from a very small part of the retina called the macula. That's how we get that fine detail vision. Or that's where you have the greatest concentration of cones feeding the optic nerve and their fiber layer. Next slide. So how does PXC affect the eye? Well, one of the most common findings is called eau d'orange, which is a French term for orange skin, it's, uh, it's, or orange peel, the, you see a mottling of the pigment layer. It actually turns out to be calcification of a layer, which is underneath the pigment layer, called Brooks membrane. So as you know, PXC affects um, elastic tissue containing um, elements of the body. Um, primarily the vascular system, where arteries have elastic tissue, um, the skin, and the eye. It is because Brooks membrane um, has elastic tissue that people get into trouble. So, uh, so this hodorage or modeling of the pigment um, is just overlying Brooks membrane and it's the calcification of Brooks membrane. If the Brooks membrane becomes severely calcified, it can develop cracks like a, the shell of an egg. And those little cracks we call angioid streaks. You see pictured here, and we'll see more, very subtle, tapering, irregular angioid streaks surrounding the optic nerve. So they have the term angioid because they resemble blood vessels. You see a vein, an artery, and then some darker angioid streaks. They can vary in width. They can vary in color. They can be circumferential as you see here, or just linear and tapering. The problem with angioid streaks are that Brooks membrane, this is now a crack in that membrane which separates a normal vascular layer in the eye called the choroid from the retina. So if there's a crack in Brooks membrane, these blood vessels can grow right through the crack under the retina and cause leakage, which leads to distorted vision, bleeding, which leads to decreased vision, and scarring, which leads to a central scotoma or central blind spot. Two more examples of angioid streaks. Again, we call the optic nerve head the papilla, so we call the angioid streaks peripapillary, surrounding the optic nerve. So this patient has heavily pigmented angioid streaks. The slide on the right shows orange to red, very thick, irregular, tapering angioid streaks. <clears throat> and the slide on your left is another color photograph of the retina where you see subtle angioid streaks and a scar. But here we see some of the features that we look for when we're examining a patient. In this area, just off the scar is a little bit of fluid, which you can see as, we see it as a turbidity. In other words, it's more difficult to see the underlying structures, which are seen clearly just below that. And it's surrounded, there's a little dot of red or blood and this lipid material or cholesterol. So that tells the examining physician a, that something is leaking. And usually uh, blood vessels do contain uh, serum or fluid, blood, red blood cells, and cholesterol, which you measure when someone takes your blood, but those elements stay within the blood vessel wall. When they're leaking out into the retina, that tells us that these are abnormal blood vessels, and these can, of course, lead to a large hemorrhage and can lead to uh, decreased vision. This is an endocyanine green angiogram on the right showing the very same patient. The angioid streaks are much more visible 
in this late phase angiography. And you can see the choroidal neovascularization, those new vessels growing from the choroid through the angioid streaks into the retina, lighting up like a light bulb. Those are responsible for the leakage and bleeding, and those are what we need to treat. This is a patient who later developed a much larger, what we call central scar, which would lead to a blind spot or central scotoma. So how do we try to prevent some of these complications? Well, a um, few of the things that we talk about and we talked about in our recent research meeting are avoidance of smoking. Smoking seems to be related to um, age-related macular degeneration and vision loss. It also should be avoided in PXC patients. We talked about the vascular system. Some patients have accelerated atherosclerosis and they have peripheral vascular disease and they can have um, intermittent claudication. And so smoking should be, should be avoided in patients who have uh, atherosclerosis as well. A third reason to avoid smoking for those smokers out there is that it can be associated with osteoporosis. Now, some patients with PXC do go on a low calcium diet, which is not generally recommended these days. It doesn't seem to decrease any of the complications, but some patients do avoid dairy products also because of the atherosclerosis and have uh, less calcium in their diet. And so you want to build peak bone mass. You don't want to have osteoporosis later on in life and smoking is associated with osteoporosis. We ask patients to wear sunglasses and certainly to wear some type of glass just as a barrier protection. One of the things you want to avoid is direct eye trauma because if you have angioid streaks, even mild trauma could lead to, to bleeding and decreased vision. So especially, we'll jump to the last recommendation, people that are young adults or um, teenagers or anybody that's active and involved with um, contact sports or racket sports should definitely wear eye protection, as you see in this picture of a gentleman playing tennis. Um, there have been cases where there's been bleeding after bearing down, which is called a Valsalva maneuver, where your face becomes red. That can happen during straining at a bowel movement or, or lifting weights. So certainly aerobic exercise is okay and light weights in the gym are okay, but nothing, you wouldn't want to be training for the Olympics as a weightlifter. Um, we talked about the calcium diet, which is not necessarily recommended. Reduced dairy and vitamin supplements are something that we do recommend to our patients with age-related macular degeneration, which has similar pathology. And the vitamins do seem to reduce the risk by about 20% of becoming active and wet. And so many of our patients do take vitamin supplements. <clears throat> Very important, since we have good treatments for choroidal neovascularization this, these days is early detection of a visually threatening problem. So we ask patients to have uh, their relatives examined for signs of PXC so that we can educate patients who are at risk for vision loss about what to look for. So that means regular exams by an IMD. Patients should also report any sudden significant change in vision. And we provide them with a grid, which is a piece of graph paper with a dot in the middle to look at. Many of you are familiar with this. And it, it's an important thing to look at once uh, with each eye separately, and maybe once or twice a week for any distortion. Why, did, why does the vision get distorted? Again, we're gonna review the anatomy. The white part of the eye is the sclera. Then there's a vascular layer called the choroid. In between the choroid and the retina is Brooks membrane. If there's a crack in Brooks membrane, choroidal vessels can grow through and elevate the retina and they leak serum and that also causes a blister in the retina. And when the retina is, is uh, misshapen like this, the, the visual uh, image on it, it appears distorted to the patient. So a sudden blurred in vision or sudden distortion are a symptom that the patient experiences and should be reported to the doctor. Again, symptoms are noticed by the patient, distortion, decreased vision,
And the doctor is always looking for what we call signs of neovascularization, which would be blood, lipid, and fluid. This is an Amsler grid. On your left is a normal grid with straight lines. On your right would be what the distortion might look like with a little dark spot and the uh, lines are wavy or distorted. We call that metamorphopsia. So how do we evaluate our patients? Well, we check their vision, of course. We uh, show them an Amsler grid, and we perform a dilated exam looking, as I said, for signs of choroidal neovascularization. We often take fundus photos. Uh, we can take color photos, special filters, like a red-free filter, that black and white picture, autofluorescence filters as well, and if we suspect something's going on, if there's unexplained vision loss, we can do angiography, either with an orange dye called fluorescein or a green dye called indocyanine green. And a recent addition to our uh, diagnostic tools is optical coherence tomography. Many of you have undergone this two-second test. It's, it's abbreviated OCT, and then there's OCTA for OCT angiography, where we don't inject a dye. And this is very helpful in evaluating patients, as I will show you. So here's an example of a color fundus photo. Optic nerve is seen on the right, angioid streaks surrounding the nerve, pole derange off to the left. You can see the pole derange and the angioid streaks a little bit better in this black and white or red free photograph. Um, an autofluorescence photo also shows the angioid streaks quite well and can also demonstrate drusen of the optic nerve or calcium of the optic nerve, uh, not seen in this particular photo. Indocyanine green angiography is better then fluorescein in PXC patients for several reasons. It does show the angioid streaks quite well. It can also better delineate choroidal neovascularization. It can image choroidal neovascularization through some thick fluid or even a thin layer of blood sometimes due to the infrared wavelength that's used in ICG or endocyanine green angiography. It was much more important in the days when we used laser or photocoagulation where we needed to identify the vessels that were leaking and bleeding very precisely to treat them with thermal laser. Today we inject a, a, an antibody against a protein and so we're not really aiming for the vessels and so the uh, accurate delineation of the neovascular network is not as important as it was uh, 12, 13 years ago. This is an example of a fluorescein angiogram showing the optic nerve in the middle, the angioid streaks, which look rather wide here, but that's because the streaks are actually surrounded by atrophy, and it's really giving it a feathery appearance to the streaks. And you can see the large choroidal vessels because there's no pigment there, there's no choroid, no choriocapillaris, no pigment, and no Brooks membrane. That's an angioid streak. This is the OCT apparatus and an example of an angiogram, someone that was in the magnesium study. The uh, diagram on the upper left shows a color-coded model uh, uh, showing the thickness in color. The thicker it is, it's more orange and red and even white in the center. The reason it's thick is because of the fluid which is underneath the retina. So that gives us a measurement of in microns, 436 microns, almost one half a millimeter. Um, so there are a thousand microns in a millimeter, so we're measuring very tiny increments. And this patient during the study was one of the patients who had injections from her private doctor over a three year period. The central thickness decreased. It had nothing to do with the magnesium. It had to do with her, her uh, anti-VEGF treatment, which we'll talk about. So treatment. We used to use thermal laser or hot laser or green laser to literally cauterize the fragile vessels. The problem with that, and probably the largest series reported out of Italy, was that there was uh, something like a 75% um, recurrence rate in the first three months, and patients did not do very well. 
photodynamic therapy or cold laser using visudine uh, was another approach, but that more or less slowed the rate of vision loss. It really did not improve anyone, and it really was not very good at stabilizing vision. Some patients were offered steroid injections to supplement the above treatments. And when we were frustrated with no good treatment, surgical intervention, you, either rotating the retina or removing the scar tissue with small forceps was used. However, in uh, 2006, June 30th, um, ranibizumab or Lucentis was approved by the FDA for wet macular degeneration. To date, no drug has been approved for the uh, neovascularization secondary to PXC, but we extrapolate the data. We ex once we have a drug that's approved by the FDA, we can, we can use it, what's called off-label, and so we do use a Lucentis uh, to treat our patients. Avastin is a similar drug. It is approved by the FDA for cancer chemotherapy, and it works equally well in the eye. And then several years later, uh, Aflibercept or ILEA was approved by the FDA for intravitreal injection, again, for wet macular degeneration, also for vein occlusions. And uh, so we do extrapolate that data and use it off-label for our PXC patients. For those um, whom we can't help, either who've lost vision due to central scarring, we always refer them for low vision rehabilitation. We don't ignore their visual needs. This is an example of someone that was in that one of our first trials, um, the phosphate binding trial. She actually was in that trial from 2003 to 2005, and she was fine. But then about one year later, she noticed some decreased vision in the right eye, and she it was July of 2006. It happened to be uh, less than one month after Lucentis was approved. And you can see there's a small hemorrhage in the center of her right eye surrounded by some fluid. In the black and white picture, you can see the hemorrhage a little better and perhaps the fluid, again, uh, making the turbid fluid making the details beneath it uh, less uh, visible. She was treated with three injections of Lucentis and her vision improved from 2060 back to 2025, where she remains last time I saw her, which was about over a year ago. She's had multiple injections in each eye. This is the ICG study showing the potent orange and a little late leakage adjacent to where the hemorrhage was. This is her uh, about two years ago in uh, actually 2000 and uh, 15, I believe, still maintaining 20-25 vision. Another case, a young lady I followed from age 21, uh, and she was looking at the Amsler grid, noted metamorphopsia or distortion in her left eye, where vision was still 20-30, so she picked this up very early. This is her right eye showing the nerve with some angioid streaks, some of which are circumferential, uh, not radial and tapering. There are some radial tapering ones as well. Left eye showed a little bit of a gray membrane just adjacent to the center of the eye in the macula, right near the center or the fovea. Angiogram shows hyperfluorescence. It does show the choroidal neovascular membrane. Her OCT showed, remember the thickened area is red just in that same region with a little fluid under the retina, and the center thickness was 320 microns, a third of a millimeter. One month after injection, you see the thickness went away, this fluid went away, and the central retinal thickness went back to a normal 258, or one quarter of a millimeter. I'll share one more case with you of a 39-year-old web designer. She had, again, circumferential angioid streaks. She was in the magnesium trial, and she developed a dot hemorrhage. Her OCT, this is the horizontal line, showed some fluid on both sides of this central scar. I show her case because she has a central scar. She was diagnosed with PXC at age 16. She was in a judo competition and was punched in the eye. She developed a hemorrhage from this trauma and was hospitalized. This was in Slovakia. At that time, 
the hemorrhage started to go away, her vision was decreased. They did a, a biopsy of her neck and diagnosed PXC. And she maintained 2050 vision. And in the sec 12 month exam in the study, she was noted to have a dot hemorrhage and some fluid. She remained in the study, but we did treat her. And some more pictures showing a fresh hemorrhage just below center, a larger hemorrhage up above. She does have what we call salmon spots, calcified drusen, other features of PXC. In case you're wondering whether it was simply the trauma that caused her bleeding, this is her left eye in March of 2017, where she developed for the first time bleeding, thickness on the OCT, subretinal fluid, and she did undergo an injection, and one month later the fluid went away and her vision returned. So I've followed this young lady for many years, and now four years later, she maintains 2050 vision in the right eye with that central scar from the trauma at age 16. And she's actually had nine injections in her left eye, maintaining 2025 vision, 24 injections in her right eye. So you see, we do have to follow people carefully to stay on top of the disease. So the future is bright. We talked about prevention. We do see some better pharmacologic agents uh, coming our way. Um, Longer-lasting agents uh, by Novartis, hoping to be approved sometime this year. We're looking for a better delivery system. We're always, uh, the uh, drops are uh, being studied right now. Um, nothing seems to be in the near future to be approved, but uh, we realize the inconvenience and risk that patients uh, undergo every time we give them an injection in the eye. Uh, everyone's heard about stem cell therapy and retinal pigment transplantation. Some of these things are being done right now in human trials in uh, London, for example, at the Moorfields Eye Hospital. Gene therapy is an important uh, strategy. We, uh, the first drug that has ever been approved by the FDA was approved for a blinding eye disease. Um, and that was approved by some tremendous work that has been done at uh, University of Pennsylvania Medical Center. Uh, so we do, that does, that is a one shot deal. It's a disease that's more like retinitis pigmentosa than PXC. Magnesium supplements look promising. We have to do further studies, perhaps larger studies and perhaps a higher dose of magnesium before we're sure that that helps. And at our recent research meeting, we talked about the importance of inorganic pyrophosphate as an inhibitor of mineralization, different ways to increase pyrophosphate either orally or by exercise. And we look forward to more data out of um, Jefferson where Dr. Awito is doing um, a lot of that research. And I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you might have. Okay, uh, we have a couple questions in the chat. I'm going to unmute uh, Julie first and then Carolyn, and you guys can elaborate on the questions that you wrote down. Hey, Julie, if you want to go ahead. Oh, hi, uh, Dr. Poop. Hi, Julie. Uh, we actually, I brought my daughter to see you probably eight years ago, uh, no, seven years ago when she was eight, when she was first diagnosed, and really appreciated you spending time with us. Um, I was just wondering about the vitamin supplements, like what type, like a lutein supplement or? Right, so again, that's extrapolating from the age-related data. Um, so the, there is a formula that's called AREDS2, which stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study Number 2. So A reds number one had vitamin A or beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E, a little zinc, a little copper. And it turned out that uh, vitamin A, there was some data about vitamin A not being very good for people that had been smokers. There were three studies showing that vitamin A or beta carotene increased the risk of uh, lung cancer. So another study was launched taking out vitamin A and they substituted it with lutein and zeaxanthine. They also threw in long chain fatty acids, which did nothing. So the current formula that's recommended is either ARES-1, 
which has beta carotene if you're a non-smoker, or AREDS2, which has the lutein and zeaxanthin and the other vitamins. They work the same. And, you know, my opinion is that, hey, even if you're a non-smoker, there are a lot of former smokers, there are a lot of secondhand smokers, why not take AREDS number two and just get rid of the beta carotene? Thank you very much. I'm sorry? Thank you very much. Ah, you're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna switch on. Uh, Carolyn says her mic is not working yet. Um, Carolyn, can you try it now? I've got you unmuted. Okay, um, it sounds like her mic is not working, so I'll just read out uh, what okay. she put in chat. Um, her first question was that diet seems to help prevent vascular sy systems. Uh, can healthy diet also help prevent vision loss? Um, and she's wondering if uh, her vegan diet can help prevent angioid streaks from progressing. Right, so she already has some angioid streaks. Well, we always recommend a healthful diet. We're lucky that um, the same kind of diet uh, reduction in red meat and lots of fish and, uh, and or a vegan diet with lots of vegetables uh, is good for the brain, the heart, and peripheral vascular disease for certain. And, you know, PXC patients generally have a normal life expectancy, so, uh, but there are little scattered reports about people needing, you know, bypass at young ages and things like that. So to prevent the peripheral vascular disease, the coronary disease, I would say, yes, a healthful diet, low in dairy products and lots of vegetables and avoidance of smoking, uh, that's key. Um, rev Stopping the progression of angioid streaks, it would be uh, hard to say. We need to figure out how to stop the deposition of mineralization in Brooks membrane. So, so with a, the healthful diet that's good for the heart and the brain is going to reverse the angioid streaks. I can't say that we have scientific data for that, but I think it's it's a wise choice and. Uh, and I would do everything, including the exercise, the benefits of exercise to prevent osteoporosis and to, to uh, increase the pyro, inorganic pyrophosphates. It's a win-win along with a healthful diet. But I can't say that it will prevent the progression of an angioid streak. Okay, she says, thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna go to LB, just a second to unmute you. It looks like, uh... Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, now it's working. Hi, yeah, I, um, I have um, had injections and, and bleeds in the past, but not for quite a few years. But now I'm getting uh, pattern dystrophy, which is causing, um, you know, vision loss in my central vision and one of my eyes. I was just wondering, is that common? Um, is there anything else that can be done for that? Well, so it's not the most common way that we have, uh, have seen vision loss in PXC. Uh, pattern dystrophy or what you're, just for everybody else who's listening, uh, probably they're saying there's some pigment clumping and pigment loss, pigment atrophy. Um, it's been reported, uh, Dr. Sang, T-S-A-N-G, did report a case in the literature. I've seen it, uh, many of us have seen it. So we never saw it in the past because people would be having bleeding and we had no good treatment for it and they would lose vision from scarring from the bleeding. But now that we can stabilize 90% of patients we do see some of the uh, late complications, which would be atrophy of the pigment um, and vision loss on that basis. So sometimes there's a leak, we dry it up with, with our injections. And because there had been fluid there in the past, sometimes it, there's a pigment disturbance which follows, and you're describing a pattern dystrophy or pigment clumping and atrophy in a certain pattern. But, um, 
but there's no good treatment when it's dry. If it's not leaking or bleeding, the injections are not of any value. So in fact, there, there are some people that think there's a slight chance that injections can aggravate atrophy. So we always try to give as few injections as needed to get the job done. Um, we try to withhold injections like they obviously have on you for several years when it hasn't been leaking. But the treatment for atrophy is down the road. That would be the stem cell treatment or the pigment transplant. That's really not available at this time, not approved by the FDA and still in experimental stages. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna go to, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, I think Aaron. Uh, first question is, what type of magnesium would you suggest uh, taking? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I can, all, I can get back to Aaron about that. I want to be consistent with Dr. Lebwell on that one. I don't know exactly what dose he's recommending. So if you could give Aaron my email address, um, I could get back to him about him. I guess it's a, I'll get back to Aaron about that. Okay. Um, and then their second question is, uh, they said they have android freaks in their left eye uh, and get a Vastin. Their doctor said not to take too much vitamin E for bleeding. Uh, and they are curious as to how much is too much. Not to take too much vitamin E because? Uh, for retinal bleeding. Okay. Well, some, some cardiologists think that way. Um, so if someone's recommending that, avoidance of too much vitamin E, uh, one can always just take the supplements, the lutein and the zeaxanthine separately. I don't like to disagree with any treating physician about they might see something that uh, I'm unaware of in the eye, but, um, but I don't think vitamin E potentiates the bleeding, so I don't particularly stop that in my patients. I'm just going to look for a dose of vitamin E. Okay, and their uh, last question is about uh, whether you think taking organic plant calcium is bad for people who have android streaks. Taking calcium supplements. Mm -hmm. Well, I would not recommend calcium supplements if we have studied a reduction in calcium in the diet and found that it wasn't effective, but I certainly wouldn't take excess calcium. Okay. Um, I think that's all for everyone who's put anything in the chat. Um, does anyone else have any, have any questions? Okay, well, thank you all for your attention. I'm just looking for the dose of uh, magnesium that was in the study. It was changed. There were some people that had diarrhea from such a too high a dose. So I will get back to you about the exact dose that Dr. Lebel is recommending. I thank everybody for your attention and have a good evening.